start with the Bill Belichick to Atlanta thing. Um, okay, there's some sort of, you know, Bill Belichick and Arthur Blank know each other. They're, they're relatively cordial, buddies, whatever. It makes some sense from that degree. The Atlanta Falcons have a pretty good roster top to bottom. There's a reason people are being mad at Arthur Smith for not seemingly being able to maximize that. On the other hand, they don't have a quarterback, and that's the thing that sunk Belichick since the departure of Tom Brady. So is this like, are these interviews like five hours dedicated to where were we getting a quarterback from? Then I'll tell you how we're going to, you know, crush the NFL. It certainly might be part of it. And Arthur Blank is an aggressive owner, a guy that's willing to spend and, and make splashes, trade up in the draft. They did a bunch in the Dimitrov era. Um, you know, they haven't done it recently because they've been kind of contracting and, and taking a step back. But and then also, yeah, are we going to talk to our Kirk Cousins? Are we going to bring in a bridge like a Garoppolo, Brissett, obviously connected to Bill Belichick? And the underrated thing here, too, is Thomas Dimitrov and, and Scott Pioli ran this building for like 15 years, and they're both New England Patriots, um, you know, ties there, too. So there, there's a lot that I'm sure has kind of been carried over from those Belichick Patriots model. That is probably the entire discussion. Yeah, who is going to be our quarterback? Are we going to trade up? They're at eight, and I think they're actually probably the team we should be watching the most. I know the Giants fans are begging the Giants to be in this conversation, and maybe they are. But um, for me, Atlanta at eight is the – this team needs to and probably could trade up for a quarterback. Like, that's the one I have circled this offseason. Are they also a team that would be interested in throwing a bag at Kirk Cousins just for the sort of the, – the guarantee of like, hey, Kirk Cousins is pretty good. We can all debate how good, you know, where is he in that, that pantheon, but he's good. Right, so good on a team that's as good as Atlanta already, roster-wise, is pretty useful. I mean, that's a good offensive line. It's got skill position players for days. The defense has taken a huge leap over the last, you know, year or so, and they then have number eight, et cetera, to build to to use to you know use them whatever they determine their second biggest need is. We can just solve the whole thing tomorrow if we bring in Kirk Cousins, throw a ton of money at him, and you know hope that he's got a few more years left at, at the level he's been at for the last few years. I do. I think they are squarely in the Kirk Cousins conversation. I think they will be probably the biggest contender with the Minnesota Vikings. Probably some other teams that may be foray into the conversation, but I think Atlanta is the number one spot. I mean, you get to play in a dome still, just like Minnesota. You mentioned all the other surrounding circumstances. On offense, you'd probably say either it's a wash or maybe leans Minnesota just because, you know, great pass catchers there too, but Atlanta's not far behind. And then obviously on defense, you know, I think it's it, it pretty strongly skews in Atlanta's favor, especially because, you know, Daniel Hunter is a free agent. We don't know, and he's by far the best player on that defense. So, yeah, I, I think they have to be, frankly, to a degree, because, you know, I mentioned like a Garoppolo, Brissett. Respect to those guys. Kirk Cousins is a clear tier or two ahead of those guys. Um, and, yeah, if the Achilles recovery goes well, maybe not even a bridge. Like, maybe he's like a two-year starter. It's a, you know, I'm not putting in the Tom Brady tier either, but it's a, you know, Tom Brady to Tampa-esque situation, and then you do maybe pass it off. And at eight, instead of quarterback, you take, you know, a blue-chip tackle to eventually replace Jake Matthews, or you take, I mean, shoot, drop in a, you know, Roma Dunze, Malik Neighbors, whatever, uh, in that scenario, and have a really, really good offense. The, the thing that I find fascinating about Belichick, if he goes anywhere that doesn't have, like, an obvious incumbent answer at quarterback or you know the top pick in the draft to go and grab one is that guy has been in the nfl for decades and tom brady has sort of uh changed the 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 lens through which we view everything that we still have no idea how he views quarterbacks like what is belichick's type at quarterback nobody has any clue there's no like trace of there's no common thread in all the quarterbacks that belichick has has brought on board beyond Tom Brady. If you look at the guys they drafted, you know, as sort of sequential Tom Brady heirs, they're very different. Uh, they're very wide stylistic. Uh, the the post Tom Brady landscape has gone like Cam Newton, Mac Jones. It's been craziness. Like even there's no common thread anywhere here. Like what does Brady or what does Belichick rather want in his starting quarterback? If you go to a team and they say, all right, everything's on the table. We can do whatever you want in the draft. We can throw whatever money you want. We can throw whatever draft picks to go and get a guy who's available potentially. What do you want in a quarterback? I don't know that anybody knows the answer to that question. Yeah, it's fair. I think if you try to say, all right, like start with Garoppolo, Brissett, uh, you know, Mac Jones, Bailey Zappi, obviously Cam Newton is a total outlier. I think that was a bit of a unique situation there. 
I think he wants guys that can, you know, line up under center, run play action, guys that are get the ball out quickly. Um, it doesn't really prioritize athleticism as much as other, um, you know, coaches. But I also think the Cam Newton thing is a great sign of uh, he also knows the game is going different directions and, and wants to adapt and change and build around the quarterback he has. But, yeah, I, I, think, I think the main thing is just a guy that is not – doesn't have to sit in shotgun, can tie the play-action game and the run game to the pass, um, you know, and, and in theory gets the ball out quickly, takes the check down, takes what the defense gives you, all, all, all those cliches. Um, but you're right. It's not the clearest picture, um, you know, in the post-Tom Brady era. I do think that in this world of, you know, Belichick is chasing those all-time records and I would imagine has to be relatively aware of – saving not saving salvaging like rebuilding his legacy it's been it's been tarnished there's no way around that the 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 way that everything went the second tom brady left the building and won a super bowl without him belichick's reputation got damaged by that and the way the new england thing is uns, uh, unspooled at the end of his career there i mean it's difficult to avoid the implication that everybody else is blaming him right the crafts whatever like the building is determined that this is effectively Belichick's fault and he's carried the can and he's on the way out. And it doesn't undo, you know, a dynasty that he built there. But it does mean that if he fails in the next place, like if he goes somewhere chasing the final wins to push him over Don Shula, but it's kind of a disaster, his, re his legacy gets damaged. So if you're Belichick, I would imagine if you're looking for a job now, you have to be saying, I need the right place. Like I can't, I can't go into a I can't go into a Carolina fail to like put out the fire and that's the end of my career. Like he has to look at a place and say I can win games and win more games than I lose in this situation pretty much immediately. And I think Atlanta's floor is really, really high. Of course, so they are, you know, to that point, they're going to be aggressive at quarterback. They aren't going into a season being, like, yeah, we'll have a Ritter Heineke situation and see how it plays out. Like, that's not going to happen, but you're still, I know the Bucs are plucky and want a playoff game. You're still probably in the worst division in football next year. Um, so that raises your floor. You're going to the, I, I know we all thought the AFC would be way ahead of the NFC. Didn't play out that way, but I still kind of do view the conferences in that light. Um, yeah, I mean, instead of playing Miami, Buffalo, uh, you know, and, and those teams in your own division, you're playing, you know, the Saints and, and Panthers that you just mentioned. So, yeah, I, I agree, but I think the floor is super, super high. Like, I'd be shocked if, if 500 isn't a borderline floor, again, because I assume they're going to be aggressive at the quarterback position. Every, everything else is there. Yeah, I, I got to say, I'm kind of curious to see what he would make of that team, particularly if they do make an aggressive move, a Cousins, or go crazy in the draft and, and get up to one or two and grab one of those top two guys. I am fascinated by what Belichick could do with that team because it has felt for a couple of years like they've been underachieving. So I'm all for that particular connection coming good. I'm also not against the idea of somebody else gazumping the Falcons and somehow 28-3 manifests itself again in coaching hires. Um, but that's just for the funds.